press the bell icon on the YouTube app to never miss a video from News Laundry. Hello and welcome to NL Interviews. Today we have with us journalist Paranjoy Guha Thakurta and researcher Shaurya Majumdar to talk about the Sahara Birla papers, among other things. Thakurta and Majumdar have authored a book, Loose Pages, Court Cases That Could Have Shaken India. In the book, the duo revisit the Sahara Birla papers and former Arunachal Pradesh CM Kalki Kopul's suicide note. Welcome, Paranjoy. Welcome, Shaurya. Welcome to NL Interviews. Thank you for joining us today. So in this book, you're examining two things in particular, right? The Sahara Billa papers and the suicide note. So at the outset, why these two cases, if I can say cases, because the second is a suicide note, why these two references in particular? These two sets of cases, let me put it this way. Mm -hmm. There are one set of papers, one set of investigations done on the Aditya Birla group Correct. of companies, which is really based on a Supreme Court order mm -hmm. to the special investigating team to look into this case. So these papers, these documents, these this cash came out as a consequence of those search and seize raids, which okay. were conducted first by the Central Bureau of Investigation and then by the Income Tax income Department. Tax. You had a similar set of income tax raids as well as investigations on the Sahara Group. Correct. But there was something common between the two. What was common between these set of papers, that's the Birla Sahara papers, mm -hmm. and the former Chief Minister of Arunachal Pradesh, Kaliko Pul's suicide note, a 60-page note, was the manner in which the higher judiciary dealt with both the cases. Okay. And it's a question of what you consider evidence. The Indian Evidence Act is very old. Mm -hmm. It's a colonial era law. But in today's day and age, what we've argued in the book is that the country's highest court, the Supreme Court, took a very, very narrow and legalistic view mm -hmm. of the documents and the evidence that was before the Honorable Supreme Court. So, Maybe. Sorry, you'd like to add to what uh, I've said. I think uh, another common element between the two cases was the involvement of the current Central Vigilance Commissioner, K.V. Chaudhary, K. who was overlooking both these investigations while heading... Overseeing, the, you mean? Uh, overseeing yeah. both these investigations while at the Income Tax Department. And these both these cases actually reached the court at the, together as part of... Uh, as additional documents submitted on a petition seeking uh, his... Uh, at the time of his appointment, like looking into this and appointment. And if I'm right, the book raises questions at his quote-unquote impeccable record slash past. Right. So there has been precedent set on what are the standards to be met and how such an appointment is to be made. Mm -hmm. And it has been argued by the petitioners that several of these standards weren't followed. And these two court cases were an important part of the evidence submitted during the same trial. So there have been cases, as we were discussing before the interview, there have been cases where a petitioner's, a petition has been sufficient, has been enough to sort of start an investigation. Why did the court, uh, and if I, I like to quote here, the Supreme Court has said that the concerned documents that were presented, quote unquote, did not arouse its conscience to order a probe in the Sahara Birla papers. And Justice Kahar Keher had said, had observed that are you relying on Sahara documents? Anybody can make a computer entry. And to the Common Cause petition, uh, it had said it had asked for better material to be produced because it said that any of uh, these documents are quote unquote unsubstantiated. And he said, and I quote, this is becoming very abnormal for us. Uh, how will a constitutional authority function if you're going to make such allegations? So I mean, why do you think the court took a different view irrespective of precedence? And why did the court do that? What we argue in this book is that there has been precedent on the interpretation of the Indian Evidence Act. More than a decade ago, there was the Jayan Hawala case where similar documents were found uh, in the farmhouse of the Jayan brothers who were alleged Hawala operators. It was based on evidence which can be argued was way flimsier than what was presented at the time of the Sahara Billa documents. 
and it was on the basis of these uh, documents that the court ordered a uh, monitored investigation. Okay. The court decided to monitor an investigation into these papers. However, the same thing wasn't followed for the Sahara Builder papers. What we write in the book is that there are striking parallels mm -hmm. between what happened in the Jain Hawala case, which was really in the middle of the 90s, and the manner in which the Supreme Court dealt with the Sahara, the Sahara and the Birla papers. One very, very important, common mm -hmm. aspect of these two sets of cases were the names of important politicians. Such as? Such as in, in the Jain Hawala uh, papers, there was the, the names of Mr. L.K. Advani, there were names of Mr. the late Mr. Vidya Charan Shukla, the, the late uh, Mr. Balram, Balram ja, Jakhar, uh, Mr. Sharad Pawar, among a host of other important politicians who were very, very important at that particular point of time. And as far as the Birla and the Sahara papers are concerned, there are a whole lot of names, starting from Prime Minister Narendra Modi, uh, Chief Ministers of Chhattisgarh and Madhya Pradesh, uh, Dr. Raman Singh, Mr. Shivrat Singh Chauhan, uh, the former Chief Minister of Delhi, uh, Sheila Dixit, the uh, the important functionary of the Bharatiya Janata Party in Mumbai, China, NC, not to mention uh, a host of other ministers, including the former Minister for Environment and Forest, uh, Jayanti Natarajan, about whom Mr. Modi in the run-up to the 2014 elections had described the famous J tax. So, so we did look at some of these issues. And it's not just politicians. The Birla Sahara papers deal with uh, two of the big business conglomerates in the country, the Aditya Birla Group and the Sahara India Parivar. So while the Sahara Papers, Sahara Birla Papers name or sort of provide... Allege. Allege that these are the people involved or there were allegations of bribery or corruption, how does the book go about corroborating this? Or is the book an effort at documenting what is already in the public domain? We have not only documented mm -hmm. what is in the public domain, We've sought responses. Earlier, when I was the editor of the Economic and Political Weekly, there was a, a this was a joint a collaborative effort with Caravan Magazine and the EPW. We sent letters and emails to all the persons concerned. Even before writing this book, two months before this book was published, we sent detailed questionnaires to nine individuals, including Mr. Kumar Mangalam Birla, uh, Mr. Subrata Roy, uh, the head of the Sahara mm -hmm. Group, to two former Chief Justices of India, uh, Justice Deepak Mishra, Justice Jagdish Kehar, uh, important politicians like Mr. Kamal Nath, Mr. Uh, Kapil Sibyl, the, uh, the Chief Minister of Puducherry, Mr. Narayan Swami. Uh, nobody responded, no. So apart from these emails, were more efforts made to reach out to them? Uh, I, I forgot to mention the former President of India. Mr. Pranab Mukherjee, whose name also figures. So we, we, we wrote to all of them, yes. So apart from the emails, were more efforts made to reach out to them to get a response? Indeed, we thought this was the best way to do this. We're putting on record a detailed set of questions. And we thought, please respond. Please respond to what you have to say. These, these are documents that have come to us. And, and mind you, the, though Justice Kehar is entitled to his views on the evidentiary value of these papers and he did indeed ask for better evidence so to say but these are records seized by government agencies by the income tax department and these have been countersigned and signed and uh, the story of how the explanations given mm -hmm. for why cash was found in the office of the Aditya Birla group, uh, why huge amounts of cash were recovered when raids were conducted on the, the, the Sahara, Bil, uh, Sahara uh, group. Those explanations are all also indeed very, very fascinating. Just as it's very fascinating to learn about how the Income Tax Settlement Commission dealt with these cases, cases super fast. So the book is raising a lot of questions, but does the book also provide answers? I think, uh I'd also like to add to the last this thing that um, this book also documents what were the efforts made to corroborate this evidence before it went to the Supreme Court. Okay. So efforts were made by uh, a former member of the Bharatiya Janata Party and a senior lawyer, Ram Jait Malani. 
efforts. We also, uh, before this, uh, while uh, Anjay was at EPW, uh, the investigating officer who was looking into this case was also contacted, who denied... Uh, she said she's not authorized to speak. That is what officials no, but, say. No, but, but by the way, we were not the only people to publish this paper. The Indian Express did a series of reports about it. Mm -hmm. So, so we, try, we depended on information which is in the public domain. It's not that we've done this great uh, muckraking job where we found papers which were not there. It's, it's more like collating the information, connecting the dots, you know, sort of trying to make sense out of all the legalese and bureaucraties to tell a story. No, what I'm trying to get to is absolutely telling a story is crucial because, as you said, going through all these legal jargons, people need a story to be able to get through all this, this heavy stuff. But these allegations are already out there. As journalists, if we are putting together a book, so how do we make sure that this, there's corroboration? Because the court has already said that this is not enough. So would it be in some way, would, am I right in saying that, would this be going against the court? I do not think so. We've placed the documents which were given to the court, mm -hmm. the documents which are in the public domain. What we disagree with is the way the court interpreted the evidentiary value of these documents. And we believe, as in the case of the, the suicide note of the former Chief Minister of Arunachal Pradesh, Kaliko Pul, the court and the investigating agencies could have done much more. And, and we believe it's not just the court, it's bodies like the the Central Bureau of Investigation, the Investigation Wing of the Income Tax Department, uh, the Enforcement Directorate, among other law enforcing agencies. Uh, actually, even last year, at the beginning, in the beginning of this year, when four of the senior most judges of the Supreme Court, after the Chief Justice himself, went on record and spoke about something that was seriously wrong in the higher judiciary, uh, I think this book also documents what were the uh, what the, was there a pattern to this? Was mm -hmm. was were they talking about something that had just happened, or is this something that has been happening for a while? So, if you look at the background of these court cases, certain kinds of patterns do emerge, and that has been documented in the book about how benches are set, how uh, these kinds of decisions are so made. I mean, in the, the next court. logical question would the, be: If I can just briefly sure. add to what he said, hmm. what we've tried to do in 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 the book is that a lot has been talked about, written, discussed about the nexus between business and politics. Sure. We want to look at the working of the higher judiciary in this infamous nexus. So I mean, the next logical question to understanding or when there are questions raised at the judiciary is, what are the p possible steps? What are the possible steps in sort of mending the judiciary, if I can say that? That's a tough question. I mean, who judges the judges? I think there's a lot that's already been written about codes of conduct of judges, uh, how the national NJAC, right? National Judicial, Judicial. Uh, Account, uh, sorry, Accountability Appointments Accountability. Commission should work. This is a huge subject, and there's already a lot that's already been discussed and continues to be discussed right. about how, how, how to improve the working of the judiciary, the backlog of cases. I don't think we've got into that in great detail. So coming back to the book, why this book now with the 2019 elections coming, knowing that these two cases would have repercussions, and why self-publish the book? Nothing to do with the elections. Okay. It just took us some time to put it all together. Uh, why now? Why self-publishing? Uh, I'm a publisher. I've published uh, about 24 books in the last four and a half years. Uh, I think um, I may not have the deep pockets that uh, large established publishers have because mm -hmm. uh, to really ensure that a book uh, does well, uh, a lot of money has to spend on publicizing its existence. But uh, I, I thought this is a book that's worth publishing. Putting and the money in. Hopefully, uh, all those who are watching this program, you included, uh, will buy this book and uh, not have the book pirated and, and, and will buy legitimate copies of the book, yes. So also, I mean, why title the book uh, Loose Pages, if we can just show the book? It's his idea. <laughs> so, <laughs> so.
So uh, it's called loose pages because that's what the Supreme Court termed these papers. So, there, so what are these papers actually? There are four huge volumes of mm -hmm. an invest of an investigation report allegedly prepared by the Income Tax Department. Apart from this, there is a 50-page... Uh, I like how you use the word allegedly prepared by the Income Tax Department. No, no, we, are, we, are very, we have to be very careful, right? These days, these big business houses, they, uh, we have a, uh, I mean, uh, have a lot of defamation cases. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if Mr. Anil Ambani's group has uh, honored your uh, news laundry with uh, a notice. But uh, I, I am a co-author of a book on strategic litigation against public participation. But please continue, please continue. Mm. So there has been a num so these uh, documents plus a 50-page uh, report uh, verdict pronounced by the Income Tax Settlement Commission. Uh, a lot of these documents were discarded by the court, citing precedent that they were not in a bound form. Okay. And they hadn't, uh, they could be easily detached. And this is all in the Indian Evidence Act, which is, I think, a hundred, uh, more than a hundred years more old. More than a now. century old. And uh, apart from this, the book is also about the former. 1872, sorry. Just like our IPC. Uh, the Indian Evidence Act, 1872. Yeah. Please continue. Yeah. And uh, also, uh, the uh, alleged suicide note prepared by the former Chief Minister of Arunachal Pradesh, Mr. Kalikopul. Uh, and all these documents have been rejected by the court mm -hmm. on different grounds. Uh, so it was interesting to actually put all of these together in a book and present like the story it has been reported at the time when these developments were happening. Mm -hmm. But a lot of it was, I mean, there were inst like mentions and a lot of it was political mudslinging between opponents. Mm -hmm. But there is a lot more to the story about like some of India's premier investigative agencies, the highest courts, and some of the biggest politicians, and of course some of the most respected business houses in the and, and as we talk, Mr. K. V. Chaudhary, the Chief Vigilance Commissioner, Commissioner, the Central Bureau of Investigation and the Supreme Court are, are, are very much in the news for all the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. And and as uh, I just to re-emphasize a point mm -hmm. that was made earlier. All this information is in the public domain. Kalikopul's widow, mm -hmm. and and in the press club, uh, the copies of this 660-page alleged suicide note was uh, distributed. And so it's yeah. available in the public domain. Yes, like you said, the, these documents are available in the public domain. Now they've put in the book, and the book is not giving answers. No, book is raising questions. Book, I, th I think it's important to raise questions. Mm -hmm. I think if our readers read through what we've written attentively, you might find some answers. Uh, sometimes you don't between, have... In between the lines? Not really. As journalists, we think it's as important uh, to raise the right questions than to pretend uh, that we know it all and we have the answers to all the questions. But we, we've sort of tried to connect the dots, yeah? So another question to you is when we talk about the Sahara Birla papers and when we talk about Poole's suicide note, what role has the media played in building or breaking these cases? That's also been mentioned in the book. Like, so basically, the media did report on these developments while they were happening. And uh, this has been noted by The Hoot, the website which follows mm -hmm. uh, the media, on how there has been remarkably little reporting on the Sahara Villa papers while it was coming out. So yes, like uh, of course, all of this is now in the public domain, and it has been reported, uh, these developments. But it is surprising. like the silence on some of the corporations involved in these. When me and my colleagues, we got hold of the papers, mm -hmm. I figured out there were large numbers of journalists here in Delhi who told me, yes, we also have the papers. I said, then why aren't you doing anything about it? I said, they're not authentic. I said, are you sure they're not authentic? So I said, the best way to check its authenticity or otherwise to go back to the question you ask is to ask the person's concern. So we asked, Prime Minister Modi, we asked Chief Minister Shivraj Singh Chauhan, Chief Minister Raman Singh, former Chief Minister Sheila Dixit. But there was they, no they, response. They didn't respond. Much later when Sheila Dixit ji was asked this question by somebody, he said, no, 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 they're not correct. This is all, these allegations are incorrect. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, but she didn't respond to all that. I mean, we would have been happy if she wrote back to us saying these documents are but coming not back genuine, to the... these allegations are incorrect because unlike the Jain Hawala diaries, mm -hmm. 
There's mention of exact amounts, dates, who paid and to whom, yes. But coming back to the questions of the journalists, concerns of the journalists that you spoke to who also had the papers, they said that, I think that they lacked corroboration. I mean, wouldn't that still be true because none of the people responded to the questions raised, including Sheila Dikshit. Look, how do you collaborate the authenticity? We know these documents exist in the records of the Income Tax Department, the Income Tax Settlement Commission, and which were presented in the Supreme Court. Who decides what is authentic or not authentic? Mm -hmm. If somebody raises or, or manufactures a document, the best way to do it is to go and ask the person, does such a document exist? Do you, do you have anything to say? We did that. Now, if we don't get a response, then what do we do? Publish and be damned. Also, for the record, neither of the investigative agencies mm -hmm. involved have come out with a clarification. After it went to court, became a public affair mm -hmm. that these are inauthentic documents that it's in the public domain now. So, my... So, in fact, mm -hmm. one of the uh, employees of the Saharo group uh, who was allegedly disgruntled is supposed to have cooked up all these papers because he was unhappy that he was made to work for long hours, right? Yes. Uh, before I come to my last question, sir, do you also want to weigh in on the media media's coverage of Pul's suicide note, Pul's death itself, as well as the Sahara Billa papers? I think when it comes to big business uh, houses, when it comes to corporate captains, when it comes to influential politicians, mm -hmm. important members of the judiciary, the media is extremely reticent in reporting allegations against them. A substantial section of the media is extremely reticent. But we believe that as journalists, we have to do our duty. And mm -hmm. if a large section of the Indian media is reticent, well, they know best why they are that way. Okay. So my last question is when it comes to reporting on court cases and orders, what, what, there's a lot of caution to be exercised. So when doing the research, when documenting, writing, telling the story, what is the caution that you took? And what are the cautions that people reporting on this should take in the long run? I think uh, this book has been read by more lawyers than we can count at this <laughs> point. Um, but also, I mean, when you're reporting on the judiciary, I think mm -hmm. a lot of it is all, I mean, you can report about judges, you can report about, I mean, the th developments around a court case, and all of these have been reported about. So it's, I mean, it's putting together all these different events which happened at the time, uh, together into one story and how they are connected. What, what happens in an open court? Mm -hmm. There are journalists, there are reporters. In India, we don't have television cameras broadcasting them live. But the fact is what the proceedings in open court are all in the public domain. And judges make certain observation, but and these are reported. Mm -hmm. These may or may not find reflection in the final judgment. That too, those final judgments too, are matters of public record. Sure. So we've sort of relied on what is there in the public domain. And as Surya pointed out, we asked our friends who are lawyers to <laughs> get to the it. copy. Mm -hmm. So whenever we were in doubt, we put the word alleged, 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 alleged. But does that save a journalist? Look, at the end of the day, if somebody wants to misuse the law, well, she or he has a democratic right to sue you. Huh? And at the end of the day, we believe the truth prevails. So what we've said that these are documents in the public domain. These are documents which suggest various things that have happened. That's all we are saying. As the author, what do you want people to take away from the book? Or what do you see would be, what do you hope the book's impact to be? I think uh, basically the work which we had to do to go through all of these documents, which is written in extremely prosaic text. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the internal correspondence from, allegedly from these business houses, which is rarely makes it into the public domain. Mm -hmm. To see the story behind it, um, I mean, it's difficult to make simplistic statements about what happened. But if we actually look at some of these developments, we see that people are keenly aware of the law mm -hmm. and where the loopholes exist, count on this ignorance. And uh, it's important uh, for the reader then to be able to 
see through all of the legalese and the jargon. To add to what Shaurya said, you know, these large corporate houses, the way they deal with regulatory authorities, the way, the way they deal with law enforcing agencies, importantly, the way they deal with politicians. We have a list of all the people who got Diwali gifts from uh, the Birla Group. Now, we are not suggesting that uh, there is any act of corruption, but all we are saying, look, this is a laundry list. News laundry, laundry list. Here are, for example, all the people who got nice Diwali hampers. Now, we are not suggesting anything. We are not even alleging that there was any sort of quid pro quo or something. But what these papers would do is provide you a very interesting insight into the working of large corporate houses, especially the way deal, they deal with important ministries, including, say, the Ministry for uh, Environment and Forest, when it comes to mining projects, when it comes to issues on environment clearance. And as far as the Kalikopul suicide note, a former governor has said this needs to be investigated, this needs to be looked into. Mm -hmm. His uh, late wives uh, are keen that the investigation be taken to a logical conclusion. So uh, what we are suggesting in the book that uh, some of these issues need to be probed deeper. We hope the, we wish you both all the very best with the book. Thank and you. thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.